All right. Good afternoon. Let's get started. We have much to watch at. We have much to do here today. Um, what we're going to be looking at is developing and managing a BI semantic model in SQL Server 2012. And my name is Casper de Jonge. I'm program manager at Microsoft uh, and Redmond. And me and my team, we own the UI for analysis services. It means Power Pivot, SDT, as it's now called, previously known bits, and SSMS. Um, what we're going to be doing today, and for those of you who, are, who were here at my previous session for Power Pivot, which I did right before this, we were looking at the BI semantic model from a business user side. And BI semantic model is a new term we introduced in SQL 2012, which encompasses the entire Microsoft BI stack from an analysis services standpoint. We'll go into that a little bit deeper. But um, before we showed Power Pivot from the business user, the business intelligence uh, semantic model, and now we'll be going to look at it from a BI professional or an IT pro user. Um, so what we're going to do today is, again, those of you who have seen my demos, my presentations before, mainly demos. I do have a few slides today to set the context, so let's get started with that. And the first thing that I want to show you is about our analysis service momentum. So analysis service is a large, growing, multidimensional, or uh, an analytics provider in the world. We have very broad adoption, larger than any other vendor. We have a very large ecosystem. There are many tools that are building on top of analysis services. Whether it's multidimensional or tabular, they're building on top of analysis services. MDX is becoming an industry language. SAP is now using MDX. So many more customers start using our tool set. And we have the highest rated infrastructure and development tools. These are all Gartner uh, quotes, highest rated infrastructure and development tools. Because we're Microsoft, we integrate with Visual Studio. We integrate with SQL Server Management Studio, built by the SQL Server team. So we can leverage from those around us. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't want to grow. So with SQL Server 2012, we introduced the BI semantic model. And what does that mean? What is the BI semantic model? You've probably all heard about it and wondering what is it? It's multidimensional debt. I've heard that before as well. And this is a way to show us what we want to do is we want to build on top of the strengths of those that we already exist. For example, multidimensional has been around for 12 years. Many very large enterprise customers use multidimensional to have 15 terabyte database cubes, uh, 15 terabyte cubes running on top of multidimensional. But what we want to do is build on the strengths. We've also heard the feedback because there were many users who actually told us, hey, ramp up time for multidimensional is very hard. It's very a difficult hill to climb and to get actually started. So we want to expand reach to a much broader user base. So what we've did is we've, and we've taken the uh, analysis multidimensional model, but now we've also embraced the relational data model. And the relational data model is very well understood by developers and IT pros. It's much simpler to understand than just the uh, dimensionality, the multidimensional cubes, the data source views, all those things that are being used by multidimensional. So what we've done with the BI semantic model is bring together the relational and multidimensional models. So there is a single unified BI platform that allows you to provide the flexibility that you need in your solution, but support the diverse needs of BI application. And what does that mean is, together that's the BI semantic model. So what that means is we have two different things. You have the tabular model for relational and you have multidimensional. And when do you pick what? That is a very often heard question. You usually, the way we think about it, and there was actually a great session on that by, by Marco Russo, a BI semantic model, multidimensional versus tabular. And he goes into many into much details on when you should pick one, what, when, uh, one over the other. If you missed it, it's going to be online. I really urge you to go and watch it if you want to think about building a new solution. Um, one of the biggest things is tabular models is actually a similar thing to Power Pivot. It uses the same concept, but now brought into Visual Studio. and gives you ad additional things that you can do, and we'll go into much details on, what, on those things later today, but you can do some additional things in Power Pivot in Visual Studio that allows you to do the things that you need to do. 
but it's much more easier to get started with tabular models as opposed to multidimensional. But multidimensional still has a lot of concepts that are almost impossible to grasp into the tabular model. Or maybe we can do it in one point, but now, right now, most definitely not. Things like many-to-many. -many. If you have a many-to-many -many and you want to expose that to your users, multidimensional is the easiest way to do it. There is actually a way to do it in tabular. There's another session uh, done by Alberto Ferrari on many-to-many -many in tabular models. So you can look that up as well. Uh, it mainly involves a lot of DAX functions. Um, I'll hint a little bit on it on my session tomorrow morning on introduction to DAX. I'll hint a little bit on it, but I won't go into too much details. Um, but if you have things like custom roll-ups, unary operators, heavy financial uh, views of the data, then multidimensional is really the way to go. If you want quick, if you want to get started soon, you need to have results soon, Tableau is very much a way to go. So there is no golden rule when to use what. Uh, all I can say is Tableau is much faster. There's not, not much tweaking to it. As long as it fits into memory, it's going to be blazing fast. Uh, you don't need to do aggregations and things like that in multidimensional. Um, yeah, so that is the, the BI semantic model. So what is the BI semantic model? It's one semantic model for BI. So Microsoft is always great in making tools, in making many tools that actually do the same. We've, been, we've had a model inside reporting services. We've had a model in Performance Point. We have a model in uh, the UDM model in our own analytics team. So now we've decided finally as a SQL Server BI organization that we said, okay, there's only going to be one BI model, and that's going to be the analysis services BI semantic model. It's going to be there for all users. Personal BI, which we use for Power Pivot, when you create a power pivot model, you're actually creating a BI semantic model. You don't even know it, but it's true. Whenever you share it to SharePoint, then you start exposing this BI semantic model. Because you, once you share it to SharePoint, you can connect to it using Excel, you can connect to it using Power Pivot, uh, you can connect to it using Power View, so the model becomes exposed. And organizational BI is what we're going to show you today. We're going into Visual Studio and building our model. But it's one model for all client tools. Because as I told you before in the momentum, we have many client tools who actually already talk to our analysis services stack. But right now, most of them talk MDX. So when you have, let's say, uh, an Excel, for example, Excel 2007 connects to any analysis services from SQL Server 2012 to SQL Server 2005. They all work because they talk the same MDX language. If you create a tabular model, Tableau model also understands MDX. So with Excel 2007, you can connect to a Tableau model, and you're still good to go. So we understand all languages. Only, unfortunately, there's a small hole in this story. Right now, we don't support DAX. For example, PowerView is using DAX as a query language. We don't support DAX against the multidimensional cube yet. We are working on it. There's no time frame that I can announce, unfortunately. But we are actually working. There are actually people working on it right now. Uh, so we are committing to fixing this hole so that you can actually disregard of how you actually build it. You can either use multidimensional MDX or query DEX as a query language against your models. So you can either create it one way. doesn't mean, really matter what way. Your client tools will be able to use, connect to it. Um, there are three major investment areas for Analysis Civic Server in 2012. We've introduced version two of the Power Pivot for Excel, which I showed in the previous session I did before uh, this session. Um, we have updated the IT Pro toolset for Beyond Professionals. So where we used to have bits, we now have what's called SQL Server Data Tools. It's the updated version of bits, with, uh, which also allows you the, the tabular model creation. And we've updated SQL Server Management Studio to allow tabular um, a view of the data. So probably you've all heard of it, but we want to emphasize it. Uh, we have three different pillars that we create our BI on. We have personal BI, and that is personal BI means it's the business user. Oftentimes, there are so many questions. Let's say you create an, a BI project 
the first thing that happens when people start using it, they come back to you with more questions, right? Because they see new things. They want to see another measure. They want to see another uh, angle on it. They want to add their own data to it. And there are so many questions that it's almost impossible as a BI team to keep up. So what we say is we have personal BI. If you have a problem that you need to solve on your own, it doesn't affect anyone else, we call that personal BI. It's your context. It's a BI solution created by one user, and the context is only for that user and exists as a document on the, on the computer. But under the covers, he has a BI semantic model. Because at one point, maybe this solution is not, no longer his or her, he starts sharing it with his team. So it becomes a context of a little bit larger team. So you share it to SharePoint. It's becoming Team BI, it's our context. It's BI solution created by one power user, but shared to a small team. And now it's managed on a server. So it's, you can actually see it, it's now becoming managed. Um, and that's what we call PowerPoint for SharePoint. And the last part is corporate BI. And this is where your business intelligence needs to be aligned. You guys, as BI professionals, will say, this is the product table that we need to use. This is how we talk about our products. This is the way how we do sum of revenue. This is how we determine it. It's a BI solution created by IT, and it's established corporate context. It is reusable, it's scalable, backed up, all those kinds of things. And this is in the analysis services instance. But over the whole spectrum, and that's what I'm gonna show you today, it's all the same BI semantic model. Uh, and you can upgrade it, if it were. So, what are the corporate BI advantages? What is the things that you can do as a, uh, a corporate, in corporate BI in SDT for Tableau models? What are the things that you cannot do in PowerPoint which you can do in the Tableau model? You can add partitions. It's not necessarily for scalability. It is because you have a lot, probably a larger amount of data. Let's say you have two terabyte of data. You don't want to if you refresh the data, you don't want to refresh two terabyte of data every time. You want to maybe partition it in smaller pieces where you can say, I only want to refresh the last year and not all years. So you can create partitions and only refresh the last year and keep the rest untouched. Um, we have another thing that's called direct query, which allows you to create your Tableau model in a direct query mode. And as soon as you send a DAX query to that Tableau model, it will be translated into SQL. So it will pass through the um, Tableau model. It's much more manageable. We allow you to manage it using SMS. You can script it out. You can do all the things that you used to be able to do with uh, Power Pivot uh, Tableau models and uh, uh, with Tableau models and with multidimensional cubes. And we support AMO. So the, program, the programmatic language that we had for multidimensional, we also have for Tableau. So you can use AMO to connect to your Tableau models and start working on it. Um, one, one thing with AMO right now is it's very much multidimensional. So um, if you connect to it, you see dimensions, measure groups. There is one thing that has just recently come out last week as a, an AMO to Tableau a wrapper. So it wraps around AMO and it gives you a, 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 a Tableau interface on AMO. So you can programmatically um, add data to it. And I think there is a question, but it's very hard for me to see. Uh, are there any uh, So the question is, right now, and that's why I said direct query, if you send a DAX query against direct query, it will be translated into SQL. Um, of course, there are plans. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do it and when we're going to do it. So there's no way. Right now, we're in the process of, we just finished SQL 2012, and we're starting to ramp up on what we want to do. So what I told the previous audience in the Power Pivot session as well, please file items on Connect. I don't know if you know Connect, but please go to SQL Server slash, uh, slash Connect, uh, connect.com slash SQL Server, and file those Connect items there. That way we can see what, the guy, what you guys are thinking about. But right now the answer is no. No. Right now, there is no way to use Excel in direct query mode. No. So please file your suggestions on Connect, and we'll see it in the, as a product team. Um, something else we introduced in SQL Server 2012 is PowerShell. So we now have PowerShell commandlets. 
And this is not just for tabular, it's also working, all of this what I'm showing you here is also working for multidimensional. So you have PowerShell commandlets that allow you to process things and allow you to uh, process and create partitions and all things using PowerShell. Uh, and the other thing that we can do is you can use SSIS packages. At the end of your ETL flow, you say you've just updated your data warehouse, you want to reprocess a partition, you can add an SSIS package that allows you to directly update to uh, your, update your tablet model. In PowerPivot, there is no security. Well, there is security on a document level. If you share a document to SharePoint, you can set your security on that, if it's accessible or not. In the tablet model, we have actually row level security. This means you can uh, make sure that, for example, you can only see from region east the data, but not from region west. So we can apply the security. And I will show you demos of all of this later on. There's no object level security yet. So this means all the tables will be, you, there's no way of hiding a table for an end user. You will be able to see the table always. Uh, so we don't have object level security. What you can do, of course, is hide the data inside that table, so it just sees an empty metadata. Um, and of course, we have the development tools. Because we live in Visual Studio, we have things like integrated source control, team build, and we have a deployment wizard. Deployment wizard you can also use with Tableau models. So the last slide is, so what about the difference of design tools? So we have a similar BI semantic model, but two design tools. One is PowerPoint for Excel, and this feels like Excel, it is Excel. There's one file, we can save it to SharePoint. This is meant for a rapid response to business problems. Solutions usually live for weeks and months, not infinite. And it's not used in your day-to-day -day business. It's used for ad hoc questions. And it's optimized for the Excel Power user. So it's, again, personal BI. As soon as we move to the corporate BI world, we have SQL Server data tools, which lives in Visual Studio. So it feels like Visual Studio. It's optimized for BI professionals. Uh, it's a project, usually. There's a business case, there are budget, there's, there are dates, usually larger uh, volumes. Uh, it's being built by a BI team. We have deployment scripts, versions, source control, TFS, all those things that you need to run a, a proper project. And with that, let's go over to the demo. Yeah, here we go. So, um, what I'm doing, and I've done the same scenario this morning, I'm, I'm a, this time I'm an IT professional inside Contoso Communications. And inside Contoso Communications, we've given out, we've installed SQL Server 2012, we've given out PowerPivot and Excel to many of our business users. And they've been creating PowerPivot workbooks. And meanwhile, I'm just working on my BI projects. But every two weeks, I'm checking my PowerPivot management dashboard. And what that means is the PowerPoint Management Dashboard is a way of managing Team BI. As soon as a PowerPoint user shares his workbook to SharePoint, he becomes visible to IT. Because what happens here is this is the PowerPoint Management Dashboard. And this you get when you install PowerPoint for SharePoint automatically. It's hidden in the, in the central admin. And you can just click on the PowerPoint Management Dashboard. And this shows you what's going on on your PowerPoint server integrated in SharePoint. So you can see things like query response time, average CPU, activity and performance. Those things you can see. But that's just infrastructure. The real interesting part lies down here. So you can see a workbook activity chart. You can see the activity list. You can see data refresh. You can see when things are being refreshed on the server because when you share it to SharePoint, your end users will be able to automatically update uh, the workbooks once a day if they want, or manual if they want. Uh, but the most interesting thing here is the workbook activity chart. And this gives us insight in what's going on on our server. And as I told you before, the things that you do in PowerPivot are usually for a short amount of time, weeks or months. And it's usually for a small amount of, of uh, people. As soon as it becomes day-to-day -day activity, as soon as it becomes you need to make your day-to-day -day decisions on this personal BI, then you're probably in trouble and you want to take over as an IT department. So what I can do here is I can run this thing. 
And you can see what happens, right? Workbooks are being used, workbooks are being used a lot, and then they go back. So this gives us queries and users. So you see workbook is being used, and it goes back. Used a lot, and it goes back in activity. So see now, here we go. So now this gives us the immediate insight. If some bubble, and each bubble is an, a different workbook, if one of those bubbles stays in here, it actually means that this probably is now becoming an, a real corporate BI thing. Someone is, some team is making day-to-day -day decisions on this thing, but we haven't even seen it, and we want to make sure that they make decisions on the right things. So this means this is managed, what we call managed BI. And you can actually do even more than this. This is the workbook activity chart. But the fun thing is, all the data that you see here actually comes out of a Power Pivot workbook. So all the data is being stored inside Power Pivot in a Power Pivot workbook that you can actually use. So let's go to this Power Pivot workbook inside Excel, uh, Excel services, and we can connect to this thing. And we can do all kinds of queries in here. And because it's in SharePoint, you can actually connect to it using reporting services. You can create your own reports. You can connect to it in Excel. You can do all kinds of reports on your own. So you see authors, um, workbook details. You can search by, by data source. So let's say, for example, you have uh, people who are using your CRM system, and they're building Power Pivot reports on top of it. And now you have to move your server to another location. What you can do here is you can go scroll down, and you can say, OK, what, what was the catalog from that CRM system? Was it called BCI? I'm not sure what it is. But. And now you can actually see the actual workbooks that are being used. So this gives you much more uh, control of whatever your users are doing. So in this case, well, what's happening is there is a workbook that is being used a lot. And we want to take it over. We want to, because there's apparently demand. There's a lot of demand for this workbook, because a lot of users have been using it. We already see it. Um, so the good thing about that, we don't have to go in and find, gather requirements, things like that, because they have already built it, built it themselves. So we know what it's going to look like. Um, so what we're going to do is we contacted the user who built it, and she said, please take it over, because people come to my desk every day and ask me, OK, can you update this? Can you use this? And that's not part of my job. My job is doing business analytics. So I have no time to do it. So you guys can take it over. That would be great. The most requested feature for my users is, right now, I only have the current year. And I also want to add a history to it. So my users want to see more data. I only need the current year as a business user, but other users need more data. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to create a temporary solution for them before I actually start working on it. So what I can do is take this workbook and bring it to my server without having to open anything except SSMS. So what I have here is SSMS for SQL Server 2012. Um, I've connected to all possible uh, analysis service instances that are on a SQL Server. And you can see by the icon to which server we have connected. So the first one I've connected to a tabular instance. You see a tabular icon. The second one is our SharePoint icon. So we've connected to PowerPoint for SharePoint. And the third one is our multidimensional. And the fourth one is, of course, SQL Server. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the first one. And we have changed a little bit how it looks. So first of all, we have assemblies here, which we don't have here, because we don't support assemblies. Um, but what you can see is if I open up a multidimensional database, you can see data source views, data sources, cubes, dimensions, roles, assemblies, all those things. If I open up a tabular model, it's much more straightforward. Just connections and tables and roles. That's it. That's all there is to it. So what I can do is, and these are my databases that run on my server instance. What I now want to do is I want to restore the Power Pivot workbook and bring it to the server. So there's, there are two ways you can do it. For those of you who know, Power Pivot actually stores the analysis services file in the Excel file. So in Power Pivot, you can break it open. You can find the, the Power Pivot file there, or the analysis services backup file. You can manually extract that, restore it here. Um, that's a way you can do it. But you, we actually have a, a real automated solution for that. So you can do just right mouse click. And we have a function here. So the, the normal restore and attach and synchronize function are all available. But we have restore from Power Pivot here. 
So what I can do is right mouse click, restore from Power Pivot. Uh, let me quickly add, find the file. And we're going to use this XLSX file and we're going to re backup and restore it on the server. So this XLSX file we're pointing to, we're going to give it the name Customer Profitability. Press OK. And that's all there is to it. Now it's going to extract the Excel file for us. It's going to restore it on the real server and it's going to do some other things. For example, um, the connections inside Excel are all based on the current user, inherited uh, credentials. And it's going to automatically change those credentials into service account credentials. So it's going to do a few things. If it's, for example, C uh, Power Pivot for SQL Server 2008 R2, it will automatically upgrade it to the newest version. So there are many things that it will do automatically for you. So now it's, ex uh, it's extracting the ABF, restoring the file, and it's done. Of course, you need to refresh. Um, as SMS, and here is customer profitability. I can open it up, I can see all the connections, and these are, those of you who were there this morning in my Power Pivot session, these are the connections that I made this morning. This is the same workbook. Um, and what I can do is I can open up one of those connections, I can now see here's the impersonation settings, it's now set to impersonate the service account, but you can change all those things that you need to do as a BI professional. You can do service account, or you can specify your own username and password, whatever you want. And you can, of course, change the connection string. In this case, it's okay, it's, it's still working, so I'm fine. Um, and what, I, what else I can do in here is I can just browse, I can see my data, and the one thing that you notice here is this again is multidimensional, because we have one browser for both multidimensional and, and tabular, so we show you a multidimensional multi view. And we can drag in some of revenue, we can drag in month name. And for those of you who have been using uh, multidimensional before SQL Server 2012, will know that this is a different browser. Um, before, we actually were able to ship an OWC control, which allows us to browse. It's a little bit more flexible than the browser that we now have. But we were the last team within Microsoft to actually allow it to use the OWC control. Now, it, uh, five years ago, it was actually deprecated. We were still allowed to ship it. And this was the last year that they said, there's no way you, you can, you, that you're going to ship it again. So we had to come up with something else. So this is the actual query designer that we have in reporting services that you can now use to browse data. Um, it's not as flexible as it was before, but it allows you to do most things that you were allowed to do before. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Um, so you can browse your data. So here we can see we actually have only a few months from 2010. And I wanted to add more data, right? So what I can do is I can open up the tables and I can go to my view and I can say partitions. And what you can see now is that there's automatically one partition created. And automatically when, you create, when you're when you in Power Pivot, we automatically always create one partition for you. Um, you don't have to do anything about it. And what I want to do is I, you can change this partition. And this you can see the SQL query that's being generated here. Um, we can change this to include all the data but actually, I don't want to be able to do that. I want to be able to refresh only the current year and keep the history just as it is. I don't want to refresh it every time. So what I can do is just copy it. And now it created the copy for me. I'm going to call this history. And just change the SQL query. I'm going to use my history view. Check syntax, it's OK, press OK, and now I just want to process my history table. So I click on process, and the interesting thing here as well is we have now a different terminology than we have in Power Pivot. In Power Pivot you have refresh, here you have process. On the server level we have process, and the reason for that is pro refresh is already taken. If you are an SSMS, refresh is a used term already in SSMS. It will be very confusing if we had two refresh one refresh for the tree view, and another refresh for your data. It will become very confusing. Uh, so processing is what we kept and what we already had in, multi in multidimensional. Um, so let's process this table. And I've only selected the history, process default, and OK, let's get going. 
So now it automatically starts loading my history table. And here it's going. It's, it's loading all my additional data into my Tableau model. And you can see it's now more data than we had before. Now we have uh, one and a half million rows. And it's done. It should be done. Yeah, now it's done. OK. So we have added one and a half million rows. And now we can see the two partitions. Um, so one of the benefits that we now have inside when we do the model here is it's fully scriptable. So let's say I want to process my month table every five hours. What I can do is I can process, click on the process, and I can select my partition. But now I can script it. And I can say script my action to a new file. So I click on the script button. Now cancel, cancel. And it now automatically created an XMLA process script for me. Uh, you can still see that it's very much under the covers a multidimensional metadata interface, so it's still using measure group ID and cube ID. Uh, but if you ignore it, you can just use this to process the partition in your tabular function. And now you can copy this, and you can use that in PowerShell. You can use that in SSMS to manually run it. Or you can create a job inside SQL Server and, and process this every five minutes if you want. Um, so you have much more granularity inside uh, your Tableau models to refresh things. And the interesting thing is, let's do refresh here. Let's run it again. And now we see we have much more data added. So I didn't have to go into change the model or anything. I just went to SSMS, added some things. And the other thing that I can add is, for example, roles. I can create a new role and uh, apply security on it. And this is very similar to what we have in multidimensional. Create a role with members and role filters. Um, I won't be doing this now. I'll have a demo later, later on that actually shows you this in more details. But you can do it as well from SSMS. OK. Now, there's one big difference. One model is created by our business user, and she knows the data. But we need to enrich the model for more business users that are not as familiar with the data as she is to be able to use it. So we need to work on it. So we want to get this part of work as a starting point and start working and adding things to it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to close this thing down. I'm going to my Visual Studio 2010. Uh, this is the new shell that we have as of SQL Server 2012. And now we can start a new project. And we have our BI templates. We have Analysis Services Multidimensional, Integration Services, Reporting Services, and Analysis Services Tabular. And you click on Analysis Service, we even have more. So we have Analysis Service Multidimensional, Import from Server, create a blank Analysis Services Tabular project, import from Power Pivot, so you can start from Power Pivot Workbook, and import from Server. So this is the second way that you can start using the Excel workbook. So I'm going to actually use that. Import from Power Pivot. Which workbook do you want to have? In this case, the customer profitability file. And now it's going to do a similar thing. It's going to start extracting the workbook from my uh, Power Pivot Excel file. And it's going to create a new Tableau model project from it. Um, what you will see is that this is actually very similar to how Power Pivot looks like. It's almost actually the same. Um, but now it's extracting it. It's creating now. You can see the projects inside Visual Studio. And we have one model BIM file. And that is the project file. You can check this into source control and things like that. Uh, so that is all supported. And under the covers is now starting to open this BIM file and start loading the data. Uh, the other thing that you see now is we have fully integrated with Visual Studio. So you have things like the error list and warnings and things like that what you expect from being inside Visual Studio. So we have those things. But other than that, it looks very much like Power Pivot. You see the same interface. You have the same tables. It's the same flexibility and things like you have. You can sort uh, all the data here. But you might wonder is, in Power Pivot, we actually have an analysis services engine running inside Excel. Where does this data come from? Where does this data live? Um, 
it's not inside Visual Studio because Visual Studio doesn't allow that. But what we can do here is, if you click on the model file, and we have a properties grid here. Again, that is what you have when you have Visual Studio. You have properties. We don't have a ribbon anymore, the same ribbon as we had in uh, Power Pivot. We now have a Visual Studio. We do have some buttons, some shortcuts. If you cannot find them if you, and you open in a BIM project, right mouse click, and then select analysis services. Uh, should be turned on by default. We have some, heard some cases that it's not showing up by default. You can turn it on here. This gives you a, a ribbon with shortcuts. But uh, I click on the model BIM file, and now we see the model file properties. And what we have here in the bottom is called workspace settings. So we have a workspace server, and that is actually an analysis service running in tablet mode. So if you want to develop tablet model projects in Visual Studio, you need to have an analysis service running somewhere. It can be either on a server uh, that you share with many developers, or you can have it on your local machine. But you need to have an analysis service tabular. Developer edition is enough, so that's the free edition. But still, you need to have SQL Server set up and install it. Um, and the other thing that's interesting here is Workspace Database. So what it has done, it has created an, a, some name, a, a random name of the project, and it's created a database on the server for us. So it's created Tabular Project 2 underscore administrator underscore large good. Um, because it's a temporary database, it's a work database. And the other setting is workspace retention that allows you to see what happens with that database. By default, it's going to be unloaded from memory. So as soon as you close down SDT, the thing is going to be unloaded from the server. But you can change that to say, always keep it there, or delete it, and things like that. Um, we can actually see it. If we go back to SSMS, refresh, we now see Tableau model project 2 underscore administrator underscore large GUID. So this is temporary. If you really want to deploy the model, you're ready, it's production ready, you can just do right mouse click, deploy, just the same way as you did in multidimensional. This is not changed. And now we'll deploy an actual model. You can give it a name. You can deploy it wherever you want. Um, you can script it out. You can do all the things that you knew from multidimensional and do the same things for your Tableau project. OK, so it looks very similar. We now have properties. Um, let's start enhancing the model. So one of the things that we also brought in, and all the features that we have, except a few professional features, everything in Power Pivot is also available here. So for, for example, the diagram view is also available here. So this shows you the diagram view. We have a very low resolution, so we need to scale it down a little bit. But all these things here are available. And the first thing that I actually want to do is I want to start renaming some stuff and hiding some columns because our end users don't want to see everything. So what I can do is click on this column and maximize it. And I can rename it, call it political geography. I'm going to hide some columns that are not very interesting for my end users. I can multi-select. Hide from client tools. You've seen I've created a hierarchy here on the bottom. I'm not going to go into too much details on how to create a hierarchy. Uh, I've shown this in my Power Pivot session. But uh, you can create those in here as well. And you can see they are now a little bit of slighter gray than the others. And these are now hidden columns. So they are available for me inside Tableau Model to use in functions and DAX and those kinds of things. They won't be noticeable for end users who connect to it. So what does that actually mean? know how to connect to it. So let's go and connect to it. So what I can do is, because it's now a live database, it's running on my tablet server, I can connect to it. We have a button here that says, analyze this data in Excel. So I'm going to click it, and it's going to give me a, a default analyze in Excel, uh, where you can set all kinds of settings, and we'll go to that later. Press OK, and now it opens up the model in Excel. And what you see now is a multidimensional view on a tablet model, because Excel only supports most of the multidimensional. So there are some things that you need to take in, into account. If you are developing your multidimensional model, uh, your tablet model, and you want to connect to it in a multidimensional. And I'll show you this in a second. But what I can do is I can drag in sum of revenue. I can drag in month name. And these things all just work. 
that are just connected to the Excel to my tabular model and we can just start doing analytics. Um, so the one thing that I want to show you here is if the model is becoming too large and you want to add things to it, adding, creating a perspective is very useful. So what I can do is create a perspective. Just click on the perspective button and I can say new perspective. So what I can do here is I can add a geography and it says political geography and I only, only want to see the sum of revenues, uh, revenue per subscriber, but not, nothing else. And I want to see, of course, dim time completely. And I want another, another perspective that says subscriber. Subscriber. So I want to see clustering, I want to see subscribers, I want to see view fact subscriber invoice. And I've created two perspectives. And where can I use them? I can use them in two different ways. I can create, use them. What? Did I press the wrong button or? Okay. Geography. Press OK. And now we see it in select perspectives. So you can have it in the, in the diagram view. So we now see those two tables. But also when the user connects to it from Excel, it's now able to select the perspective. Um, so if we do analyze in Excel now, I can select the perspective, press OK. And now inside Excel, we only see these two tables. Um, just one warning, this is not a security feature. Giving a perspective to a user, you can easily hack around it. It's not a security feature by, by a long shot. If you want to have security, use security features, not perspectives. And the same thing goes for hiding tables or, or columns. It is also not secure. You can send discovers, you can do things if you know what you're doing, to so just be able to browse it. So hiding and perspectives is not a security feature. Um, we'll go into security a little bit later, but just a warning. And again, we can use the same uh, hierarchy which we already created, and it's just immediately available inside Excel. Um, okay, so we've created perspectives. Now let's add some security. I'm gonna move back to default, and I'm gonna add security. And I'm gonna click on my roles button, and I'm gonna add a new role. And this is gonna be my east role. And I'm gonna do read permission, give me read permission, you can read and process and process and administrator, but in this case, I'm just gonna do read permission. And you can add members to your role. In this case, I'm gonna leave it empty. I'll show you members in a second. But I'm gonna add a row definition. And here, it uses a DAX filter. And what it says is, specify a DAX expression that returns a Boolean value. Only rows that match the specified filter are visible to the user in this role. So what does that mean? So that means if, let's say for example, I want to type in here equals dim political geography. Oh, it's called political geography. Political geography region equals east. What now will happen is whenever a user that is part of this role connects to my tabular model, an analyst service will look at the, at the political geography table and for each and every row, we'll check the region's column and say, does this column contain east? Yes? Okay, then you're allowed to see it. If it doesn't contain east, you're not. If it doesn't contain east, you're not. If it does, you're allowed to see this row. So that means that this table now is filtered down to only see whatever you see here. So I'm gonna press okay, I'm gonna apply it. And now you can use this role function. So let's go in and check what the end user would see. I'm going to click on Analyze in Excel, and I'm going to check role. I want to see it, how the user from the role east would see it. Press OK. Now I'm doing, again, um, sum of revenue by geography. And now you see it automatically shows me east. It only shows me east. So there are two distinct differences between multidimensional and tabular. In multidimensional, you had something called visual totals. So that would allow you to show you the sales for the entire US 
even if you only have rights to see one of the subregions. We don't have that in Tabular right now. So if you have a filter on something, you will never able to see anything else that is not filtered. And the other interesting thing is, uh, in multidimensional, when you have a dimension and you create security role on that, whenever you use that dimension, it will be filtered down. If you use any other dimension every, and any other viewpoint, then you will be able to see and the older data. In Tableau, this is very different. If I now would, for example, show you um, by month name, you will still only be able to see the 3.9 million. So it's still always filtered by East. So automatically, Tableau will filter all the tables that are related by the security that you added. So that is a very different uh, thought pattern than it was in multidimensional. Okay. Um, one more thing that I want to show about this is one of the most popular features, or one of the most common things that people used to do in, with security in multidimensional is dynamic security. You want to add security to your model, but you don't want to change the model every time or add roles when someone else is being added. Because you want to create an application for your end users to just manually enter who's going to add the roles and then it will automatically work. Uh, so I'm going to show you how you can do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import a table, and in this table I'm going to add uh, the roles. It's going to be from the table that I'm importing. So I'm going to import it from SQL Server, and I'm going to use Power Pivot. I'm going to add my security settings. I'm going to add service account. Although it's not best practice, I'm still going to do it. List of tables, and I'm going to add my region users table. So I'm adding this table to my model, and it's very simple. It's just one row. Okay, and it added this table to my model. And it's just very easy. It says region east where username is test user. So now I have a table in my model that actually contains the security that I want. So now we need to apply that to my roles. So what I can do, and I'm not creating a relationship on purpose. So what I'm going to do is create a role, and I'm going to call this dynamic, dynamic, I'm going to get read permissions, I'm going to actually add a member my test user, check names, okay. I'm going to add a row filter, row filter. But in this case, I'm going to now going to use a real DAX expression. So I've already opened it here. And what this DAX expression is going to do, it's going to dynamically generate what it's allowed to see. So what I'm going to do here is, remember where we before said region should be east. We, we added a string on our own. Now we're going to say dim political geography region is that equal to look up a value? And we're going to use a DAX function that will actually look up a value from another table. Look up the value where region from our region user table is equal to the username of the region user table, and where that is equal to the username that is connecting to the tabular function, tabular model. So we have added the username function as a DAX function. And this will automatically return the current user that is connecting um, in this function. So this will automatically return, in this case, when test user connects, it will automatically return where the username is test user. And where the region the test user is, is part of, if it actually contains the same region as the one we're checking. So for each and every row in this table, it's going to use this function to check, does it exist for this user and this region? And if that's the case, we return true, you're allowed to see it. Um, I've heard some questions about when you use this and performance. This is actually going to be very fast, because what happens is this is very deep down into the engine. So this function is being calculated before anything else. So this is going to be always pretty fast. Uh, of course, it depends on the DAX function that you write, but this, this function is very fast. There is a blog post on this by Cathy Dumas, uh, which explains into many details how this function will work. Um, you can come up to me afterwards and I'll, I'll show you the blog post. 
Um, so we're going to paste this in and we're going to continue and we see a sign here. So what actually always happens is it's real DAX function, so we'll actually look at it if it's if it's written correctly, if we have to use the right formats. In this case, I've just renamed the table. So I'm going to change this into political geography. Copy and paste. Now it will actually work. So we press OK. And now we're going to connect again in Excel as this test user. Uh, there's one slight problem. Um, the analyze in Excel is not smart enough to fool our engine to run as test user. So we need to use something else. So what I have here is I created a command file that actually runs Excel as test user. I'm going to use the, ex the just normal command run as, run as user, test user, and run Excel as it. So this is a very handy way to test security. Uh, what I usually do is I create one user that where I can just play around with security to see if it actually works. Um, so we're opening Excel now as this test user. We can connect to my Tableau model. So I'm connecting to, tab to Analysis Services, Tabular. This is my database, and I'm gonna, you see the perspectives. Uh, but I'm gonna actually connect to the model right now. Press Finish, OK. And we're dragging in sum of revenue by geography. And now you see east. So it automatically picked it up. Um, the other thing that I want to show you real, real quick is I can go in, go to that table, edit, Let's change it into West. And the only thing now that I have to do is reprocess this table. Now it's changed to West. I refresh in Excel. I now see it automatically switch to West. So this is now dynamic security. You don't have to change the roles anymore. The only thing that you need to do is change it in the table, process it, and you're done. Um, Okay, the other interesting thing here is, and this is the other thing that I was alluding, alluding to before, many users now have been used to Power Pivot. So they're very much used to the t seeing the table and seeing something interesting like cost in the table and just dragging in the values field. But that doesn't work because we're looking at it from a multidimensional angle. And this pivot table field list from Excel doesn't allow us creating measures on the fly. That doesn't work because we're now using from a different view. Excel doesn't allow us to do that yet. So what you need to do if you create a model, a tabular model, and you want to share it to your end users, you need to create those measures for, on your own so that you can actually give them to your end users. So that's what we're gonna do now inside the tabular model. So we have few subscriber invoices here, and I'm gonna add units, usage, revenue, and cost, and I want to create measures for them. The only way that we have inside Tableau model to create measures is our calculation area or our measure grid on the bottom. That's the only place that we can use measures, uh, create measures. So what I can do is just create on this, click on the sum button and now it will automatically create those measures for me. And it will show me the values. So it's sum of units and all of these are actually, um, yeah, so this, uh, we can apply formatting. In this case I'm gonna add it's going to be units, it's going to be a whole number. Revenue is going to, it's already a currency, so I automatically picked it up from the data type. So you can create your measures here. And what you can do down here is just, it's a very open form. You can copy and paste it. You can type in whatever you want. You can add comments in here. So it's a very open format. Um, there's one problem. This is not really what most of our BI professionals Want. They want to have more control. If you have very large models, you have many, many, many measures. So we are actually looking into what we can do. Uh, but right now, this is the only way you can add measures. 
Uh, there's one small tip that I can give you is if you want to try and find measures, because let's say you have four, 40 measures, it's already going to be hard to finding them. What you can do is go to a diagram view, um, hide all the other stuff, and now you can only see the measures. Um, so you can now only see the measure, and you can quickly go and find one and do go to. And now you immediately go to this measure. And you can add comments here, you can hide from client tools, you can hide uh, objects, you can add descriptions to them. So this allows your end users to be e easier for you to use the measures. Uh, but this is a very important place uh, inside the Tableau models. This is the only one place that you can add, add measures. So for example, what I want to add now is a year to date. So let's say total year to date equals is function, a DAX function, a time intelligence function, total year to date, sum of revenue, where dim time, where my date column is here. And if you want to know more about DAX and time intelligence functions, I have a DAX session tomorrow morning at 10, which we go into more details about it, how we use time intelligence functions. And there are certain tricks that you need to apply when you want to use those time intelligence functions. But I press enter and that's all there is to it. I now have a year to date. I'm gonna add a currency perspective. So now we go back, let's drag this out, let's do refresh. Now we go in and see the total year to date. It's going to be empty because we need to drag in months. And voila, total year to date is there. It's pretty straightforward if you uh, know DAX a little bit and you know what to do. Um, okay, so we saw the results in Excel. So another thing that we might want to be able to do is um, we can connect to this in PowerView. Because the Tableau model is now running inside a server, we can now connect to the same model in Excel using MDX and also to the, do it in PowerView. So what I can do here is I went back to SharePoint and we have two different files. We have BISM files and we have RSDS files. And what I can do now is to create a new document called the BISM file, BI Semantic Model Connection. And let's call it test. We just need to point to a server, so this is gonna be my tabular, and I'm gonna add a database. So what I can do here is copy the name from this guy, the temporary database, and paste it in here. And this is all the rest to it. And now I've created a part of view connection to my Tableau model. Um, I have another session tomorrow at noon, which I go into much more details on how you can optimize your Tableau models for part view. So we'll go into more details on what you need to do on the SharePoint site. Uh, for the BISM files, RSDS files, and also how you can optimize your model for PowerView, because there are certain properties, and I'll show you a little bit later where they are, but in, in the other session, I will go into much more details. Um, so now we can play, click Create PowerView Report, and we now have the PowerView Report on top of it. So that's all there is to it. So we have, again, the same measures, the total year-to-date will be here. So now we have connected to, to PowerView as well. So one model, you can use it in Excel, you can use it in PowerView, and you can use any other tool like Performance Point or even Panorama to connect to it because they all understand MDX. Um, okay, let's go back. And the properties that I was alluding to that will allow you to optimize your model for uh, uh, PowerView are something called, we call reporting properties. So if you go to the bottom right, you see we have special reporting properties that allow you to set, allow you to specify default behavior in PowerView, where you can allow, all you've seen all seen the demos of PowerView and they look great, but there are some th tips and tricks to it. So that, that's what I'll be showing you tomorrow because it takes an hour long uh, to show you what are all the intrinsic details of that. So we have them on tables and we have them on columns. So we have those properties here as well. Um, okay, so there's one more thing that I would like to show you. Because what we also had is direct query. And direct query is the mode that the analysis services Tableau models can run in, and run in. And if you go to the model BIM file, you see here direct query mode. Currently it's turned off, but you can turn it on. And if you turn it on, it will no longer be in memory. The database won't be in memory. Now it's, everything is in memory, right? It's the Tableau model, everything is in memory in our 
Pretty Pack engine. Um, if you turn direct query mode on, it will be removed from memory. It will be removed from memory, and all the DAX queries, unfortunately no MDX, all the DAX queries will be translated into SQL and sent to the underlying database. So let me quickly show you a demo of that. So I have here a relationship to a direct query model that I'm running here, direct query. And we have the same table. I can do revenue. Let's make it a little bit larger. Revenue by month name. And now it's translating those DAX queries into uh, SQL queries and it's actually showing me the results directly. And I can show you that. Let me add another demo table where I have row one. Now I can go, can go in here to my SQL server and to my Mac data mark tables. Here's my demo table. So let again do edit rows. And I can do row two, demo. Okay, I've added the rows. Let's go back, press refresh. And here we go. Now it's automatically added. So we created a model. You can add all the semantics. You can add measures. You can do all those kinds of things. But you can directly pass them through to SQL. There are a few things that are not there. For example, you can only use SQL for now. So only SQL Server is allowed. You can only use one uh, connection in your model. So you cannot match up data. Um, time intelligence functions don't work. So there's, it's kind of a useful in certain scenarios, but not in all of them. Um, we are still working on it, and we'll improve it in the future by adding other data sources or things like that. But uh, for now, this is what we can do. Um, OK. And there was one more thing that I want to show you before we close, the, close off. In this morning session in Power Pivot, I showed how I created a, a feed that I was, so me as the IT department, we have data that we want to use, have our Power Pivot users be able to use. So we have certain data sets that are very interesting for those end users, but uh, how do you share it to them? How do you make them consumable in Power Pivot? Well, one of the ways that I'm going to show you now is you can create a, an, an atom service feed that Power Pivot users can just click on, and it will allow it to be imported into Power Pivot without any hassle. So just a link where they can click on, and then the data starts becoming imported. So what I'm going to show you, and this doesn't have really anything to do with the tablet model, but I feel like it's an, an, an IT responsibility to be able to expose data to the end users and give them data sets that they can use to make the business, uh, uh, the personal BI a success. So what I've done here is I've created this data feed, and when I click on it, let me quickly open it for th those who weren't here this morning. I can press on open, and now it'll automatically open Power Pivot for me, and it allows me to import the data. Finish, let's just import the thing. So I just clicked on the link in SharePoint, and it automatically added a table to me in Power Pivot. So it's actually loading now. Um, what I want to show you is how you can quickly create one of those. And yeah, here we go, it's importing. So what you can do is, while it's working, what I've done now is I have created a reporting services report of the data that I want to expose my end users for. In this case, I've created a reporting services report that I say is called cluster per subscriber. And here's just a simple data set. And if I open it, you will see it's actually using a prediction join, an MDX query, a DMX query against my data mining model. Because in this case, I wanted to show uh, per subscriber the clustering. What is the likelihood that my subscribers are going to churn, are going to run away from me? So I've data mined it. I've created a data mining model in a multidimensional environment. And I've actually created a query against the data mining model and expose it as a, as a view for my end users, to, for them to be able to mash it up. Um, so I just created a simple re a query and just added a simple table. And what you now can do is when you share it to SharePoint, here's all the data. And the, good, the cool thing here is you can add all kinds of caching, all, everything that you, knew, you can do in reporting services. I've done here as well. I've added some caching. 
And what you can do now is click on this button, and that's new in SQL Server 2008 R2, export the data feed. And this will create an Atom Service document for me. So I just clicked on it, I saved the Atom Service document, and I published it here. Now my users can just go in and click on this Atom Service feed, and the data will be brought into Power Pivot by just one click. They don't have to go to a view or anything. This is much easier. Um, that's one small downside. It is, of course, a few steps. So if you have 50 million rows, I'm not so sure if you want to do this. But if you have dimensions, you have, let's say you have one timetable in your organization that you want everyone to use in their Power Pivot reports, this is a good way of, of exposing that in your organization. Um, okay, so that's it for the demo. Let's go back to the slides. I can figure out how this thing works. Yeah. So, um, what have we seen? What are our new BI semantic model features? We have richer models. We can do KPIs, descriptions, persist formatting, advanced sorting. We have distinct count. We didn't touch on it, but I will in tomorrow morning's DAX session go into more details about this thing count. And we can do drill through, uh, perspectives, hierarchies, multiple relationships. We have parent child support. I didn't touch on that right now, but I'll show you in tomorrow's DAX session as well because you need to use DAX for parent child. Uh, we have optimized usability. We now have the diagram view. Uh, we have a measure grid. We have various usability enhancements, so small things. I uh, showed most of them this morning in the Power Pivot session. Um, and we have reporting properties to optimize our Power View um, functionality. All these features are available in both Power Pivot and SDT. So all of them, they look a little bit different, but they're all available. So what are the new professional features? Well, the transition across the BI spectrum, the restore from Power Pivot in SMS, import of Power Pivot models into SDT projects. Um, we have new tablet projects in SDT called Direct Query. Uh, we have security, we have deployment, we have data management, partitioning in both SMS and SDT. I didn't show you that in SDT, but you can do it in SDT as well. And it gives you a little bit more nicer user interface because you can actually create your filters in a visual way and you don't have to type SQL. Um, we have management of tablet database in SMS, scripting, all of those things. Summary, a whole bunch of new features. Um, some related content, um, enriching your BI semantic model, tablet models with DAX, that's my DAX session tomorrow morning. Optimizing your BI semantic model for performance and scale, this is one of the sessions for my, for my colleague Dave Rickard, and I think it was actually on Tuesday. So if you missed that session, it's available online, go check it out, because it goes into many details on what actually is happening during processing, how are things compressed inside the engine, uh, what, how does the queries behave, very interesting. And the other session is the one from uh, Alberto, uh, Marco, Marco Russo, business multidimensional versus tabular, and this gives a lot of examples on when he was trying to use multidimensional, but actually switched to tabular and vice versa. So he has a lot of real uh, hands-on work on when to use both, when to, when to use one over the other. Um, I'll be tonight at Ask the Experts. I'll be tomorrow here as well, but if you have more questions, you can ask me tonight. Um, some track resources. Please fill in the evaluations. We very much would like to hear what you think about it and what your feelings are about the session and things like that. And time for questions first. If maybe can someone give me a little bit more light because I don't see anything. But we can start asking questions. I can try if I can see the hands. Any questions? Yeah? Yes. Yes. The, so yes, it, it works also on the uh, because uh, it actually filters down the, the directly the table and it also filters down the relation table. They're always related uh, in some sort of way. So if you say you're not allowed to see region east, there's no way that you can see re see data from region uh, any other than east. Yes, because this actually skips the relationship as we used it. You use the lookup value formula to actually skip it. 
Um, so I would say yes. Any other questions? None? Oh. Um, any spatial support on Tableau models? Um, no. There's no spatial support on Tableau models. We are working on it, and you will, yeah, you'll hear more about it later. Any other questions? Yeah? Can you create it from within a store procedure? I don't think it's, so, um, so, I'm not so sure if you can do it from within a store procedure, but it is queryable. Uh, if you can query it with MDX, so we have ADOMD.net, which is our programmability point. You can add it to your uh, project that you're using and send queries to it. So if you can, you can send MDX queries or you can send DAX queries, either way. But it is queryable. I'm not so sure within a store procedure of SQL Server, but within code, it is most definitely queryable. Yeah, so you can create a connection there. So if a linked server is possible, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't done it, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And if, if you can do it multi-dimensional, multi, multi, multi you can also do it with Tabular. That's the only thing I know. Uh, but I'm not sure if it, so I can find out. Uh, if you come to me tonight, there will probably be someone who probably have tried it before, and who will know it. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much for your attention. And